change takes our kind of energy. Last November in Denver, Colorado, members of a federal grand jury investigating the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant made an appeal to President-elect Clinton. Please direct the district attorney to appoint a special federal prosecutor or a suitable independent person to investigate whether any federal criminal laws or rules may have been violated during the course of the special grand jury's investigation. But in December, the federal government began investigating the jurors themselves, and only today, the Justice Department announced it would take no action against them for allegedly leaking what they secretly learned about the nuclear bomb factory. But we were to exercise our own judgment. Tonight on Frontline, inside Rocky Flats. I was the one who was contaminated. My face, um, my respirator, my hair, my hands, my sleeves, everything was hot. Correspondent Al Austin investigates 30 years of accidents, cover-ups, and contamination at Rocky Flats. After all the secrecy, it turns out no one knows what's here or what it may do. Tonight, secrets of a bomb factory. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. At the feet of the Colorado Rockies, within sight of Denver, surrounded by farmland without crops, a collection of ugly buildings crouches behind barbed wire. Visitors are not welcome. It is the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. Through 40 years of Cold War, outsiders have known only that atom bomb parts were made here and that it was a place full of secrets. Some have suspected it was brewing an environmental disaster, it and all the other weapons plants. But Rocky Flats is special. It was forced to give up some of its secrets. This man knows a lot of those secrets, secrets he cannot tell. Wes McKinley lives 200 miles from Rocky Flats in the southeast corner of Colorado. He denies it's desolate here. From almost any point, he says, you can see a tree. The last horizon, the last thing you say, that is Oklahoma. You're looking into Oklahoma. McKinley was a math teacher for a while. Now he's pleased to call himself a cowboy. But one day in 1990, the luck of the draw yanked him from his prairie serenity and made him foreman of a special federal grand jury. Did you know what you were getting into? No, not hardly. I didn't have any idea what a grand jury did. For two years, an FBI agent in Denver had been uncovering Rocky Flat secrets and thought they amounted to crimes. The cowboy, McKinley, and 22 other Colorado citizens were supposed to decide whether anyone should be put on trial. Ken Peck, a Denver lawyer, was also selected for the Rocky Flats grand jury. We met in the intermediate building, the federal courthouse over here. Uh, it is a, a, a 1960s vintage building, and in the far back side of it is where we met. We would meet there for about a week a month. Uh, occasionally, we would have For two and a half years, they met behind closed doors to hear the story of Rocky Flats. The very first witness, a plant technician, alerted them that the story bordered on the fantastic. Her name was Jackie Breaver. I was working with an experimental product. This product made me very ill. And I later found out that these symptoms were radiation sickness. I had uh, really odd, big bruises on my body that you could touch that didn't hurt. All of my hair on my arms fell out. I was nauseated, I was vomiting, I had diarrhea for three weeks. 
Um, I had this incredible, terrible rash on my skin. Uh, it was the most painful thing I've ever felt in my life, like the worst sunburn that you have ever had. And I went and complained to my management. They told me that it was from the caustic that they washed the coveralls in. And they weren't going to investigate or do anything about it. But they also were cracking the whip on me, you know. We, we don't care <clears throat> what you what you have to do back there. We need four or five more products this week. Government films offer glimpses of the kind of work Jackie Breaver did at Rocky Flats. Technicians handling plutonium with lead-lined gloves inserted in a wall of glass and stainless steel called a glove box. Inhaling a microscopic amount of this metal could be fatal. These pieces are machined to triggers that detonate nuclear bombs. I was talking about the material that we were overexposed. Jackie says when she told her bosses about unsafe conditions at the plant, they punished her by assigning her nasty and dangerous work. And then two weeks before she was scheduled to talk to the grand jury, something worse happened. I was called out of, out of line, called in for overtime to come in at 3.30 in the morning to work. Both my and Karen's operations were running at that time but they assigned us to another room completely different from our normal rooms. Just me and Jackie went into that room. Just me and Jackie. All the gloves were brand new on that glove box. Um, I couldn't understand why we were assigned there, but job is job. She stuck her arm in. She had to go all the way up to the, the top of her shoulder to get this material, and she extended her arm and stretched that glove as far as it would go. The alarm sounded in the room. She had opened up a small pinhole in the end of one of the gloves. And when she pulled out the vacuum of actually just removing her arm out of there, had brought this fire ash up into her face. When I was the one who was contaminated, my face, um, my respirator, my hair, my hands, my sleeves, everything was hot. I remember looking in that window at her and feeling like I was going to weep there she was. I still feel that way, too. Totally contaminated. She had it on her face. She was breathing it because she didn't know. All I could see was Karen's face in the window and the door. It, it was the saddest thing. Um, she looked totally helpless and frustrated. It, it, it choked me up. I mean, I mean, seeing her face, you know, I'm sorry, Jack. I'm trying everything I can do. I'm trying. I'm so sorry. Two fellow chem ops were coming down the hall and they saw me standing there with my little can and uh, they were laughing and pointing and one of them came up and he said, that's what you get for making waves. I was shocked. I mean, there was stuff that I never knew went on. Shirley Kyle is a farmer's wife who says she knew nothing about the weapons plant before she was chosen to be on the special grand jury. She's not allowed to talk about anything specific that happened in the jury room. But she found it shocking and complex. Yeah, it was complex. Very complex. And I'm sure a lot of people didn't grasp even as much as I did, and there was some that grasped. Place. And Connie Modecker is a suburban Denver grandmother who carries around religious medals and gives them to people she likes. She was on the grand jury too. As time went on, I um, was more surprised of different things that were taking place and also I started beginning to feel um, confused about it all. I had the feeling that my purpose in there was to show that if this company didn't give a darn about its workers and you know the, here's one of the workers who's telling you about these terrible things that are going on then they certainly don't care about the environment i had a feeling i was just there to rile them up and i don't even think they really believed me we don't know if the grand jurors believed her or the hundred other witnesses they heard over the next two and a half years 
But in the end, they did something unprecedented. President-elect William Clinton. On August the 1st, 1989... There stood jury foreman Wes McKinley in front of the federal courthouse in Denver, accusing the prosecution and the federal government of covering up the truth about Rocky Flats. Please direct the district attorney to appoint a special federal prosecutor or... The grand jurors still won't reveal the secrets they heard, but we've been able to piece together some of what they learned about Rocky Flats and what led to their rebellion. Grand jury's investigation. The atom bomb was born of a frantic coupling of government and civilian enterprise in World War II. A weapon beyond most of our imaginations. And everything about it said, look away, ask no questions. President Truman announces an atomic explosion detected somewhere in Russia. In a race with the Soviet Union, America built nuclear weapons factories as fast as it could, each with a specialty. Denver was thrilled when a nearby meadow, Rocky Flats, was chosen for one of the plants. It meant thousands of high-paying jobs. The Atomic Energy Commission and Dow Chemical would run it. Rocky Flats' specialty would be plutonium, the main element that destroyed Nagasaki. The work was too important and too sensitive for outside scrutiny or ordinary regulations. The public saw only some unrevealing government films of the plant interior and had to take the government's word that whatever was happening inside, it was necessary and safe. I became active in, in the union in, in 57 and it, it, was, it was pretty no-no to talk about safety. Nobody did that. Jim Kelly became president of the Steel Workers Union at Rocky Flats. I was a radiation monitor on what they called the site survey team. I kept complaining to my supervision, you can't, those drums have hot stuff from 776 building, which was a plutonium building. Those drums... There were thousands of drums full of oil contaminated with plutonium sitting in the fields corroding. Kelly says everyone at the plant knew they'd mean trouble. A rabbit ran across the road, what is right now the central dissecting streets of the plant. We got him, got out and we caught him. Had no idea that we were what we were about to find. But this rabbit was what we call screaming ass hot. I mean, he pegged our instruments. Our instruments at that time, the maximum it would count before it went off scale was 100,000 counts a minute. The needle went like that. This rabbit was just hotter than a firecracker. The wind was the first thing that went wrong at Rocky Flats. It was supposed to blow away from Denver, but it didn't. Some in Denver suspected the people running the plant were hiding other mistakes as well. But it was almost two decades before a man named Edward Martell found proof of that in 1970. Dr. Martell worked for the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is perched on a slope of the Rockies overlooking Rocky Flats. Other tumors that took a little longer. That was a... Dr. Martell is a nuclear scientist who took part in early atom bomb tests in Nevada and the Pacific and became one of the world's leading experts on the effects of radioactive fallout. Well, the plant is simply uh, six or seven miles south of here as a, as a crow flies. You can see a hazy outline of some of the Rocky Flats buildings now, but very hazy. There have been very frequent fires and accidents in the plant, but we didn't hear about them until uh, the plant history was aired out more fully after the 69 fire. When they couldn't hide it anymore. They, when they couldn't hide it anymore, they, they made a remarkable number of admissions. One news report said a metric ton of plutonium burned in the 69 fire. Where had it gone? Rocky Flats insisted no plutonium ash had gotten out of the building and refused to allow outsiders to investigate. Exasperated, Dr. Martell and a colleague tested the soil outside Rocky Flats for plutonium. 
east of Rocky Flats, we found ratios that were 400 times higher than uh, it should be if it were from fallout alone, which means that 99.97 uh, five percent of the plutonium we found one mile east of the plant came from Rocky Flats. No question about it. The government, embarrassed, finally conducted official tests. When they checked out our measurements, uh, east of Rocky Flats at the east fence, just outside the east fence, they found levels ranging up to 1,500 times uh, fallout levels. So they simply confirmed a mile e farther east, it was 400 times. So uh, our results were confirmed. And, uh, but the plutonium contamination was not from the 1969 fire, after all. It was from those barrels of plutonium-laced oil that Union President Kelly had warned about. Which corroded and broke open and leaked into the ground. Melinda Casson was an environmental attorney and now is part of a governor's council that tries to keep watch on what Rocky Flats is up to. And it turned out that they leaked about 11 curies of plutonium into the ground. What does um, that mean, 11 curies? If properly distributed, it would be a lethal dose to every human being on this planet. Winds roaring down from the Rockies had been distributing the plutonium from those corroded barrels eastward toward Denver. And that's the plutonium Ed Martell's soil tests had found. The government bought up most of the contaminated land and fenced it in. But landowners outside the fences sued, claiming Rocky Flats had contaminated their land too. The case dragged on for 10 years and uncovered more secrets. Radioactive and hazardous waste had been incinerated for years and had been sprayed in nearby fields as irrigation and stored in barrels which were surreptitiously and illegally buried. Threatened with exposure about that, a plant official had suggested claiming the mound created by the buried barrels was the work of Indians burying their dead. But these secrets didn't get beyond the court. The case was settled for $9 million with the provision that the evidence be sealed. And there it stayed. Public distrust of all the weapons plants was growing. In 1975, a new agency was put in charge of the plants, the Department of Energy. And at Rocky Flats, Dow Chemical was replaced by Rockwell International as the civilian contractor but nothing seemed to change. Rocky Flats continued to enforce the keep out signs with heavily armed security, trained to repel terrorists. Much of the plant was off limits even to the Environmental Protection Agency and the Colorado Department of Health. They were told the plant's hazardous wastes were none of their business if they had any nuclear ingredient. Melinda Casson suspects it was not a matter of principle, but a necessity. They couldn't get a permit to operate it legally. That's true with most of the functions at Rocky Flats, and unfortunately it's true with the weapons complex generally. If these facilities had to get hazardous waste permits for everything that they did, they couldn't do it. DOE understood that. Rockwell, the operator, understood that. That's the reason that we had these environmental battles is because the plant can't operate in compliance with the law. Uh, these reports here were submitted pursuant to the 1986 agreement. Uh, Finally, bending uh, under public and legal pressure, the Department of Energy gave the Environmental Protection Agency a mammoth report describing the hazardous waste at Rocky Flats and what had been done with it. The hieroglyphics in these notebooks translated into bad news, and a lot of it. Not easy reading. No, no, it wasn't easy reading. There was data about hazardous waste stored and buried and sprayed and heading toward creeks and reservoirs and into the air from Rocky Flats. And there was more bad news to come. A man named Jim Stone, an engineer who'd been fired at Rocky Flats, came forward with a frightening story about some of the buildings there.
blaming his firing on his refusal to keep quiet right. about it. The, uh, the ductwork in, in building 881, which was one of the original buildings built in 53, and it had uh, all the crud of the ages, a lot of, uh, of a radioactive material. Stone said he alerted the contractor, Rockwell, that plutonium had accumulated in the ventilation ducts of other buildings. Pounds of it. Pounds of it, yeah. They found 62 pounds in 71 or 707, one of them. 62, not, not 62 pounds when one microscopic particle could be lethal. Oh, yes. It takes about four pounds to make a bomb. If Stone became a whistleblower. He went to the FBI. As luck would have it, the FBI's Denver office had an aggressive environmental specialist, John Lipsky. Lipsky would spend two years investigating Rocky Flats. He won't talk about the investigation, but we know he studied all 27 volumes of the waste report the environmental inspectors had pried out of Rocky Flats. He took samples from the creek that runs past the plant. He hired a helicopter pilot to take infrared pictures of the plant at night. Lipsky thought those pictures showed hot spots that could mean radioactive or hazardous waste was being incinerated illegally. And he was given a confidential memo from a Department of Energy official writing to his superiors. Rocky Flats, the memo said, is in poor condition generally in terms of environmental compliance. Some of our waste facilities there are patently illegal. Here was a smoking memo, evidence that the people running Rocky Flats knew they were breaking the law. Lipsky drafted a 116-page affidavit describing what he knew and what he thought he could prove, if he could get into the plant. It turned out to be the perfect time for Agent Lipsky to get action, 1989. This will happen with the new president had declared himself the environmental president and appointed a fire-breathing secretary of energy named James Watkins, who promised to clean up the weapons plants. President Bush told me on the 11th of January, uh, 1989, uh, that he had a mess in the Department of Energy facilities. Will you clean up a mess? And I said, well, because you're a friend, because you asked personally, I'll do it. But let me tell you, it's a task. Bush also appointed a very ambitious new U.S. attorney in Denver, Mike Norton. Norton and FBI agent Lipsky prepared for Operation Desert Glow. On the morning of June 6, 1989, federal agents wearing blue coveralls raided the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. At about 9 a.m. today, approximately 75 agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Criminal Investigations, assisted by representatives of the Department of Energy's Inspector General, uh, began the execution of a federal criminal search warrant at the United States Department of Energy's Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant near Denver, Colorado. Here was something brand new. One government agency raiding another the government raiding itself. When the FBI left Rocky Flats nine days later, it had 960 boxes of evidence, three and a half million pages of documents. U.S. Attorney Norton said it would take a special grand jury to get to the bottom of it all. The grand jury turned out to be more special than Norton had in mind. It began on a promising note, Federal Judge Sherman Feinsilver, seen here swearing in new U.S. citizens, made the grand jurors feel very important. In essence, he told our grand jury, as his predecessors had told other grand juries, that we had the responsibility to act in the best interest of the people of the state of Colorado, and that we should act independent of him, we should act independent of the FBI, and we should act independent of the prosecutors. The grand jury would hear complicated testimony about some very strange alleged crimes. Pond Creek, for instance. Rockwell had mixed radioactive and hazardous sludge with cement and made thousands of gigantic blocks of it, 
so it could be stored and shipped. But it didn't work. Many of the concrete blocks became mushy. The waste leaked onto the ground, where it could drain into a creek. Frontline obtained a confidential investigator's report that documents how the managers of Rockwell knew the concrete was a serious environmental hazard, but did nothing about it. The grand jurors also saw pictures and heard testimony that Rockwell was disposing of hazardous waste by spraying it nonstop, even in the winter, into the fields, calling it irrigation, many times what the ground could absorb, resulting in sheet runoff downstream to municipal water supplies. Complicated as it was, the grand jurors began to understand the evidence. I um, know from the evidence and what I heard, that there were some people that should have been indicted. I think they should have been indicted. But in Washington, they saw things differently. Attorney General Richard Thornburg had approved of the FBI raid on Rocky Flats. But now it appeared the Justice Department realized their country cousins in Colorado had gotten them into a deeper trough of truth than Beltway politics permits. Executives of Rockwell International, one of the government's most important contractors, were about to be put on trial. Unlike most federal prosecutions, environmental crimes are routed through Washington, where higher-ups in the Justice Department must okay everything that's done. Is that raining in? Or is Assistant that... Attorney General Barry Hartman had charge of the Rocky Flats case. We were concerned about a lot of things with the case. We wanted to make sure that this case was going to ultimately be won if it was going to be brought, that's for sure. We wanted to make sure that we weren't sacrificing larger policy issues depending on the kind of... One of Washington's concerns was that Rockwell's lawyers were playing hardball. Prosecute Rockwell, they warned, and we'll prove Rockwell's employees were merely following orders from the Department of Energy, your client. I, I know, and I don't think there's any mystery, that Rockwell said at several points um, that they their intention in terms of building a defense was to put DOE on trial. Denver's U.S. Attorney Norton insists he was running the prosecution, not Washington. But his assistant, who was actually presenting the case to the grand jury, wrote a memo saying he didn't think Washington had enough fire in the belly. And Norton himself saw that. Because early on, uh, uh, people in, in Washington, uh, they actually thought less of the case than we did. It's one reason why I What were they doing in Washington, D.C.? Okay. So that's where their orders were coming from. Evidently, I don't, I don't really know. It's all confusing, and I wish it could be simple. But it wasn't simple. While the grand jurors were planning indictments, the prosecutors and Rockwell were planning a deal. On December 9, 1990, the prosecution team met in Washington to review the case. Rockwell had offered to pay a million dollar fine in exchange for no indictments against its employees. Over the next six months, the two sides haggled over money. U.S. Attorney Norton said 52 million. Rockwell countered with 10 if the prosecution would make a statement saying the crimes had caused no threat to public safety and no environmental damage. In Denver, FBI agent Lipsky was told to stop collecting evidence against individuals. The grand jurors knew none of this. Did something go wrong between the prosecutors and the grand jurors? It fell apart. That point occurred whenever the grand jury started looking at uh, some directions, wrongdoings that they felt may be investigated. Well, then the prosecution seemed to have abandoned us at that point. We weren't allowed to do anything. We were told to go home. It was in March of 1992, and we were to meet for the last time. And Mike Norton told us. Told you what? That a plea bargain had been reached. Rise, please. Suddenly, it was over. A plea bargain. Rockwell pleaded guilty to 10 environmental crimes from 1987 to 1989 and agreed to pay an $18.5 million fine. 
about the same amount the company had collected in bonuses during that period. No, I don't. Excuse me. In your guilty plea, does the corporation... Rockwell's attorney refused to talk about it, and the company has maintained that silence ever since. Does Rockwell have any comment, sir? No. The plea agreement said the crimes had caused no dangerous contamination outside the plant. And, after all the commotion, the sensational raid, the years of investigation, no individuals were indicted. I was sick. I was really disappointed. Uh, I think there was a, a multitude of emotions, which ranged from uh, people who laughed, thought it was a joke, you know, April Fools or something like this, to people who realized and appreciated that it was not a joke and were outraged. But they could not express their anger or talk about what they knew at all. The case was closed. Then an extraordinary thing happened. A story appeared in a weekly newspaper in Denver saying the grand jury had written up indictments of five Rockwell employees and three employees of the Department of Energy. But the prosecutor and judge had blocked them. The reporter, Brian Abbas, says 12 unnamed jurors were so frustrated with the plea bargain, they had risked prosecution for contempt of court to talk to him. Um, these jurors are not naive about what they did in talking to me. They understood that they violated their oath. They understood that if they're, uh, they're ever caught, it's proved who talked, that they have certain legal consequences to pay for that. One time fairly major project. Though he denies it, the prosecutors suspect lawyer Ken Peck of being the ringleader of the grand jury rebellion. They learned that Peck had once actively opposed a plan to incinerate waste at Rocky Flats and had not told the court about that possible conflict when he was chosen as a juror. The jurors did go up into Peck's office late at night and write a report after the prosecutor had told him to go home and not do a report. The judge, whose instructions had said they could write one, ordered the report sealed. But someone gave it to reporter Abbas. It omits names and most other details, but it calls the Department of Energy and Rockwell indistinguishable co-conspirators who engaged in a continuing campaign of distraction, deception, and dishonesty. Rocky Flats is an ongoing criminal enterprise, the jury said, and should be closed. And it didn't come from a government agency. It didn't even come from a collection of lawyers or scientists. It came from citizens, ordinary citizens, a school teacher, a bartender, a bus driver, a retired sheriff, a rancher. They're not prosecutors. They're lay people who did a great job and who probably thought there was enough evidence to indict. But enough evidence to indict, and in addition, the evidence that a grand jury sees is not necessarily evidence that's admissible in court. The prosecutors say they got almost no information from the plant's employees. Rockwell had found a way to orchestrate the familiar silence of Rocky Flats. Even after its removal as civilian contractor, Rockwell provided employees with attorneys who coached them and attended their interviews with investigators. The prosecutors say they couldn't pierce this defense enough even to find a chain of command at Rocky Flats. There were no high-level individuals who, to whom criminal conduct could be attributed. What we found instead was that a cult, what we called a DOE culture or mentality that had prevailed, which, which elevated production of nuclear materials above concern for environmental compliance. Did all of you agree about that? Yes, uh, without exception, the conclusions we reached were unanimous among the prosecutors and the investigators. Now, during the Maybe course, not. Investigators. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Behind closed doors, FBI agent Lipsky told a congressional subcommittee that when he learned of the plea agreement, he became physically ill, and that Norton's lead prosecutor in the case had said he thought there was enough evidence to indict individuals, but he was outvoted. How can you have crimes, but no criminals? We did have a criminal. The criminal was the company in this case. But a company can't go to jail. That's true, but there are many cases when you don't have enough evidence. In a, an area like this, as I said before, you, you may have a crime, but not have enough evidence to convict a particular individual. In any large organization, you have individuals who each may know. Out on the Colorado prairie, that sort of reasoning doesn't make sense. 
Cowboy grand juror Wes McKinley sees the Rocky Flats matter in more down-to-earth terms. If there has been a crime, somebody should be held accountable. The grand jurors could find individuals to indict and could find the chain of command. Why couldn't the prosecutors? The judge's instructions told us we were to use our own judgment without fear, favor, or criticism of the court, the public, or the prosecutors. So Still bound by the grand jury rules of secrecy, Wes McKinley can only talk about the Rocky Flats case I obliquely. I can't tell what it was, but I got the feeling that there was factors that was outside of what we were doing that motivated this. And that's why they wanted us to leave without finishing the job that we were sworn to do. Congressman Howard Wolpe was chairman of the congressional subcommittee that looked into the way the Rocky Flats case was settled. It's outrageous. Basically, the Department of Justice wrote into this plea bargain every one of Rockwell's essential conditions. What our investigation revealed is that there really is no accountability in government. That if you have people justifying individual behavior on the grounds that the culture of the agency sanctions that behavior, basically you have no way of changing the behavior or of holding individuals accountable for illegal activity. Can you reform it? Can you create a new culture? Absolutely. Without, without holding individuals accountable? No, you cannot. You cannot. You must hold. That's Even why former that's Energy that's Secretary that's Watkins, though he won't say there should have been indictments, right agrees with part of the grand jury's message. I, I agree with the concept that uh, fixing accountability and responsibility on all of these issues is critical to good government. And we had lousy government working this Department of Energy for too long. And that direct line One phrase above everything else in the grand jury's clandestine report gets the prosecution's goat, the one calling Rocky Flats an ongoing criminal enterprise. The prosecution insists the crimes are over with. The true story is that, yeah, there were serious problems. They've been addressed. They're not problems currently. How are things at Rocky Flats today? Rockwell has been replaced by a new contractor, EG&G. &G, and the Department of Energy is supposed to have turned over a new leaf. The Cold War is over. The plant isn't making bomb parts anymore. Everyone's talking about cleanup and dismantling. And the government keeps insisting the public is safe. Benny Abbott has raised miniature donkeys and horses next door to Rocky Flats for 33 years. It was near here that Ed Martell took his soil samples 20 years ago and found them heavy with plutonium. It is good, don't Can you? you can taste any plutonium? No, no, you really can't. Once Rocky Flats is cleaned up, a sports complex and golf course may go here. From about here, where the ball fields would be, is about three and a half miles. Uh, over two Rocky Flats. Benny knows that mysterious waste, which seeped underground at Rocky Flats, has spread her way. Yes, I, but she's I not about to leave. And, she know, plans for her children to take over here when she dies. You've had some unusual things happen to animals, haven't you? <laughs> uh, yes, we have, but we don't know the causes of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, as I say, I don't want to be damning something when I don't know the, the yeah. cause. But we have had some definite peculiarities. And that's kind of all I want to say about, about that. Um, well, does it seem as though there have been more than you might expect? Yes. Even as people wonder about the dangers of Rocky Flats, they keep moving closer to it. 
For three years, Benny and others who live near Rocky Flats have been attending meetings to hear about studies into what the weapons plant has done to the environment. The studies are directed by the Colorado Department of Health, but are paid for by the Department of Energy. We don't expect you to believe us at the outset. We feel that we have to... Last week, the Health Department released a preliminary report on the studies. It indicates the plutonium that escaped from the plant may not be the problem the neighbors feared. We would like to know what's in our backyards. I mean, and we have never been able to find out. While further studies depend on information that's still classified, the preliminary report reflected soil samples that found plutonium well below the danger level. But no one really knows how dangerous plutonium is. Plutonium standards have been set by groups of scientists, most of whom work for the nuclear establishment, and they have fluctuated, sometimes conveniently. Twenty years ago, for instance, when suburban Denver lawns tested in the danger zone, the Colorado Department of Health and the Atomic Energy Commission met and simply raised the safety limits by ten times. We haven't seen anything that, that shows a significant danger to the public. Are you satisfied that the Colorado the, Health Department uh, team now assigned to measure the contamination works with the standards it inherited? Could you build homes in this area? Uh, there aren't any homes being built in those areas. No, I know, but, well, I'm just trying to get, see, I'm, well, I'm frustrated here, trying to find out what is dangerous. Where, where does it, where does plutonium contamination in the soil becomes, become dangerous? And to whom? Um, well, in a sense, you're asking the question, how clean is clean enough, or how dirty is, is dangerous? And, and again, that's a question that has... Well, let me, let me put it in these terms, life-threatening. And, uh, and you're saying that uh, it's well below too much. The standard, the, the levels of contamination by plutonium out there are well within safety limits. Well, zero is desirable. More yeah. than zero is less than desirable. When does it become uh, dangerous? Point at two? 2.0? Um, with regard to the plutonium workers, we found elevated risks for leukemia and the lymphopoietic cancers. That's the lymphoma. In the early 80s, epidemiologist Greg Wilkinson, working for the Department of Energy, found that statistically too many Rocky Flats workers had died of certain types of cancer. When management and the Department of Energy, certain folks in the Department of Energy became aware of of our findings, they got rather upset and uh, attempted to uh, uh, make it difficult for us to, uh, uh, to get those findings published. Now, this wasn't and in the decade since, Wilkinson says, the DOE has not allowed another such study of plutonium workers anywhere. When did, when did you start working on uh, standards for radiation. Hoping to find out how the government decides what are safe and unsafe levels of plutonium contamination, we went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to find the man who's probably most responsible for setting the original standards, Dr. Carl Morgan, known as the father of health physics. Well, in the very early period when I came to Oak Ridge, in September of 1943, there were no standards. Uh, Initially, the standards that I set here at the laboratory for plutonium were based on his studies of three rats. In the years since, Morgan has come to believe he was wrong, that much smaller amounts of plutonium can cause cancer. In these studies, we found that the present levels were at least 500 times too high. When he began to testify against his own standards, Dr. Morgan says he was removed from the organizations that set them. They decided I'd been on the International Commission and the National Council long enough, so I was made... That's true if you're looking only at the average. Ed Martell has sounded the same warnings as Carl Morgan and says he too was ostracized. So long as the DOE and the nuclear industry control the plutonium and pay the scientists who study it, Martell suggests, we won't get the truth. It's a cons conspiracy of sorts. It's not just ignorance and wishful thinking. It's a conspiracy. 
it's conspiracy of such a nature that if Carl Morgan and I and a few others that think that plutonium standards are not conservative by factors of a hundred or a thousand, if we're right, then uh, they're suppressing uh, information and research on such possibilities is a crime against humanity. This is the primary entrance point for all employees, vehicles, etc. The big building directly behind you is building 707, which is... Was After weeks of asking, we finally got to take a tour of Rocky Flats. Sort of. Two public relations representatives accompanied us. One from the Department of Energy and one from the new contractor, EGNG. Rocky Flats has quadrupled its public relations force since the FBI raid part of the new culture of cooperation with the public. This building here, this is a high bay loading facility. That brown one? Yeah. yeah this one right we here. didn't get to go into any buildings, but we did get to see some of the things we'd been hearing and reading about. This is the most notorious spot of all, the 903 pad. Everything has a number at Rocky Flats. How thick is that? Do you know? I think it's about 12 inches. I can find out for you. This is what became of all the oil contaminated with plutonium that leaked out of thousands of corroded barrels. Enough plutonium to kill everyone on Earth. They buried it here and put a thick layer of asphalt over it. I can't help feeling a little uh, uneasy standing here. It's a good thing the public relations people were along to reassure us. I, would, I don't feel at risk here. I've worked here for three and a half years. Um, Still, there was that story about the hot rabbit. True, that was 20 years ago, but plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. Very low levels out here. Very manageable levels, but... Our next stop was the 881 hillside. No one knows exactly what was dumped here or how much. When we did our assessments, there were reports of people that had taken things out of the back door of 881 in the late 50s and, and just dumped them. Now, that was, you know, it may have been a, a thing of water. It may have been a pan of solvent. It was pretty common practice. Down below is the creek that fed the drinking water of several towns. And we got to see the pond Crete, the debacle the DOE couldn't deny and wouldn't deal with. The attempt to get rid of radioactive sludge by encasing it in cement that collapsed. It's been reprocessed or repackaged and is no longer leaking but it still looks unworthy of scientists, and still no one knows what to do with it. They wouldn't let us go into the hot side, the fortress within the fortress where the bomb triggers were made, even though all production at Rocky Flats has been shut down. The problem is in the prep time. It's difficult to explain why can't you get in there, and it's really... It's not, it's not because it's dangerous to be in there. No, I... It, we may be able to get in there. You, you probably could. It, 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 we applied to get into the hot side, waited several weeks. They said no. Hmm. I don't think what? we're going to be able to get you a shot from here, because I can't see any way to, to get the. So we didn't get to see where Jackie Breaver was contaminated. And we didn't get to see the ventilation system that had 62 pounds of plutonium in it that no one knew about. A lot of it's still there that no one knows what to do with. And of course, we didn't get to see the vaults of pure plutonium, hundreds of tons of it, some sources say. We asked the Colorado Department of Health about those buildings. Oh, in effect, you don't really know what's, what's inside some of those buildings. Is that fair to say? There are certain materials they deal with out there, uh, classified materials that we have no need to know what's in those buildings. You have no need to know No this? need to know for some of the classified materials they have in there that are materials that they manage and process and that sort of thing. The Department well, of Energy will have to take care of that. That's correct. That's correct. The, the, these environmental problems were caused by, by the same people who are now in charge of, of cleaning it up, supposedly. To Peter Johnson and Amelia Govan, really who are congressional advisors on technical issues, doubt that the Department of Energy and its partners, the contractors, have reformed. Even when new leaders come in to the Department of Energy and say there shall be a new culture, 
there shall be openness. The public will be let in. It's very difficult to get that message down to each of the sites and to the contractors who have been running these sites over the past years. Rocky Flats is not alone. There are all the other buildings and all the other nuclear weapons plants dotting the country. 2,700 buildings. There are buildings, huge buildings, that are totally contaminated. And nobody has even begun to estimate how much it will cost to clean up those buildings. There is no process yet in place for deciding what to do with those buildings. Say you've got an office pool and you have to pick a final number, the final cost for this cleanup. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear your bets. Well, we could easily spend a half a trillion. At the end of the tour, we got to see the fields where they sprayed hazardous waste year after year. Sprayed them far beyond saturation, calling it irrigation. No one knows how much of it or where it all went. There isn't much to see now, like a battleground long after the battle. After all the secrecy, it turns out no one knows what's here or what it may do. That's some secret. Of all the nuclear weapons plants, we know most about the problems of Rocky Flats because of the grand jury that got mad. Some of the jurors say they have more to tell if they could. Do you think it would be important for us to know what you know? I think it would. I think it would be in your best interest. Connie Modecker and Shirley Kyle became fast friends during their two and a half years on the grand jury. At the end of it all, there was one final bizarre twist. The judge in the Rocky Flats case has asked for a federal investigation of his own grand jury for talking. So the tragic um, turnabout, this, this did turn out to be. I'm, I'm very sad. We're there to do our duty. And now we're being prosecuted for coming forward and wanting to, the citizens to know what they need to know, should know, and have the right to know? Does that make sense to you? That's right over there. Connie Modecker recently moved. No, she has just discovered that despite all her misgivings about Rocky Flats, she has moved to within sight of it. Mother Mary, pray for us. I can't believe Can you, you, you got believe this close to it, Connie. How far can you run? Where can you go? You can. Not this area. You get over there. I feel pretty good, to tell you the truth. Um, I have my day. I have, and in, I am disabled. And I have learned to compensate. I know that... Jackie Breaver sued Rockwell and several of its employees for harassment, intimidation, and assault. Convinced her plutonium contamination from the leaking safety glove was intentional. In August 1992, a federal judge dismissed the case for lack of evidence. She has been unable to find employment or medical insurance. But I have some things on my wish list, and that is I want a congressional investigation, a real one, a real investigation in front of God and everybody. Let's all tell the truth. I want that. No more congressional hearings on the Rocky Flats case are planned. Next week, the Energy Department will finally begin releasing some classified information about Rocky Flats, including an inventory of leftover plutonium, more than 28,000 pounds of it. But the full truth about Rocky Flats may be buried forever, buried in the fields of waste, and eventually buried with those who made the bombs.
Friday night, Sir David Frost talks with the president of Mexico about the NAFTA treaty and more. Get a different perspective on what's happening with our neighbors to the south Friday at 9. Now stay tuned for Islam in America. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. For video cassette information about this program, after all the secrecy, it turns out no one knows what's here or what it may do. Tonight, Secrets of a Bomb Factory. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. At the feet of the Colorado Rockies, within sight of Denver, surrounded by farmland without crops, a collection of ugly buildings crouches behind barbed wire. Visitors are not welcome. It is the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. Through 40 years of Cold War, outsiders have known only that atom bomb parts were made here and that it was a place full of secrets. Some have suspected it was brewing an environmental disaster, it and all the other weapons plants. But Rocky Flats is special. It was forced to give up some of its secrets. This man knows a lot of those secrets, secrets he cannot tell. Wes McKinley lives 200 miles from Rocky Flats in the southeast corner of Colorado. He denies it's desolate here. From almost any point, he says, you can see a tree. The last horizon, the last thing you say, that is Oklahoma. You're looking into Oklahoma. McKinley was a math teacher for a while. Now he's pleased to call himself a cowboy. But one day in 1990, the luck of the draw yanked him from his prairie serenity and made him foreman of a special federal grand jury. Did you know what you were getting into? No, not hardly. I didn't have any idea what a grand jury did. For two years, an FBI agent in Denver had been uncovering Rocky Flat secrets and thought they amounted to crimes. The cowboy, McKinley, and 22 other Colorado citizens were supposed to decide whether anyone should be put on trial. Ken Peck, a Denver lawyer, was also selected. Change takes our kind of energy. Last November, in Denver, Colorado, members of a federal grand jury investigating the Thanks Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant made an appeal to President-elect Clinton. Please direct the district attorney to appoint a special federal prosecutor or a suitable independent person to investigate whether any federal criminal laws or rules may have been violated during the course of the special grand jury's investigation. But in December, the federal government Judge began investigating the jurors themselves, and, and only today, the Justice Department announced it would take no action against them for allegedly leaking what they secretly learned about the nuclear bomb factory. But we were to exercise our own judgment. Tonight on Frontline, inside Rocky Flats. I was the one who was contaminated. My face, 
Uh, my respirator, my hair, my hands, my sleeves, everything was hot. Correspondent Al Austin investigates 30 years of accidents, cover-ups, and contamination at Rocky Flats. For the Rocky Flats Grand Jury. We met in the intermediate building, the federal courthouse over here. Uh, it is a, a, a 1960s vintage building, and in the far back side of it is where we met. We would meet there for about a week a month. Uh, occasionally, we would have... For two and a half years, they met behind closed doors to hear the story of Rocky Flats. The very first witness, a plant technician, alerted them that the story bordered on the fantastic. Her name was Jackie Breaver. I was working with an experimental product. This product made me very ill. And I later found out that these symptoms were radiation sickness. I had uh, really odd, big bruises on my body that you could touch that didn't hurt. All of my hair on my arms fell out. I was nauseated, I was vomiting, I had diarrhea for three weeks. Um, I had this incredible, terrible rash on my skin. Uh, it was the most painful thing I've ever felt in my life, like the worst sunburn that you have ever had. And I went and complained to my management. They told me that it was from the caustic that they washed the coveralls in and they weren't going to investigate or do anything about it, but they also were cracking the whip on me, you know. We, we don't care <clears throat> what, you're, what you have to do back there. We need four or five more products this week. Government films offer glimpses of the kind of work Jackie Breaver did at Rocky Flats. Technicians handling plutonium with lead-lined gloves inserted in a wall of glass and stainless steel called a glove box. Inhaling a microscopic amount of this metal could be fatal. These pieces are machined to triggers that detonate nuclear bombs. I was talking about the material that we were overexposed. Jackie says when she told her bosses about unsafe conditions at the plant, they punished her by assigning her nasty and dangerous work. And then two weeks before she was scheduled to talk to the grand jury, something worse happened. I was called out of, out of line, called in for overtime to come in at 3.30 in the morning to work. Both my and Karen's operations were running at that time, but they assigned us to another room completely different from our normal rooms. Just me and Jackie went into that room. Just me and Jackie. All the gloves were brown.